Stay hungry, stay foolish. Today's book was born out of a desire to show how and why ritual is critical in our everyday lives. Using examples from across the animal world, including elephants, chimpanzees, orangutans, wolves, dogs, lions, zebras, whales, flamingos, fish, and even insects. Although social animals exhibit many rituals, this book focuses on 10 important rituals that are essential to our well being greeting rituals, group rituals, courtship, gifting, spoken rituals, unspoken rituals, play, grieving and healing, renewal and travel and migration. Reincorporating the lost art of ritual will better equip us to discover new ways to reconnect to others, to ourselves and to the natural world. It's a fascinating book and we heartily welcome the author of that book, Wild Rituals, 10 Lessons Animals Can Teach Us About Connection, Community and Ourselves. Caitlin O'Connell, welcome to the show. Thank you, Aidan. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Not only is it a great Irish name, Caitlin O'Connell, but you are related to one of the leaders in Irish history, Daniel O'Connell. Yes, that's in fact my father's name, Daniel O'Connell. I don't know how many generations back I should know that, but, <laughs> but yes, I am related. <laughs> Your background story is fascinating. I'd love if you'd give us a bit of that fact, background story, Caitlin. And to give context to the book, I pulled a little bit from the book here. You said your journey in Africa began in 1992 when you and your husband, Tim, had planned a gap year between degrees and arrived in South Africa with very little money. You traveled between national parks in and around South Africa for nine months before you were offered jobs in the Zambezi region of Namibia to study its elephant population. And that gave rise to all your work and this phenomenal book. I'm a behavioral ecologist by training, and um, I've always loved animals you know, from playing with frogs and streams and um, fishing and a really you know, my father was a great lover of nature and taught me how to appreciate the different animals that we'd see. You know, we had a big yard growing up in New Jersey and, you know, there'll be a possum hanging from a, a tree at night with babies coming out of the pouch and just things that seem so otherworldly that were in my backyard that I, I just really um, bonded with nature and we'd go on camping trips. And so, in between my master's and PhD, my uh, boyfriend at the time, now husband, took nine months to travel in Africa. And um, it didn't take long for uh, folks in national parks to realize our, our value. My husband was very technical and I had a master's in behavioral ecology and entomology, which is study of insects. And um, we volunteered in different game parks and then got to Namibia and um, we were offered this job for three years to study elephants in the Zambezi region. And it was because the person who was supposed to take the job, it took three years to get the money and we happened to show up at the right place at the right time. And once I had this opportunity to study elephants, I, I just couldn't leave it. I mean, it was a, a dream come true. And to see this society of animals that was so similar to our own and be able to study them, I, uh, I've made it my life's work. And you've shared it so well in this book, because ma many of our listeners may be going, what the heck has that got to do with innovation or transformation? And I say after reading it so much, because you tell us the power of rituals in the animal kingdom may seem completely unrelated to rituals in our own lives. But by observing how rituals are in other animals, it is an important reminder of our own need for ritual. Rituals inform our behavior, particularly when we are feeling uncertain about what to do. And it's that very point I thought is key to innovation. We are always uncertain about what to do next because you're creating the future. And oftentimes rituals like you tell us can inform those futures and inform our mindsets. You have to think of, of rituals as kind of the the social grease when you get into that meeting room and you're feeling a little uncomfortable or uncertain of how some business transaction might go and looking that other person in the eye and smiling and greeting 
shaking hands, all of these things disarm the situation and make you feel more comfortable. And, um, and then there's, there's, so that's how the greeting ritual plays in, but play is a really surprising, um, ritual that helps us innovate. Uh, if you watch lion cubs playing with each other, they're really practicing and learning how to hunt and they're really cleverly moving their bodies in, in ways that they wouldn't normally do. And so it's, it's an exaggerated, uh, motion, but th those exaggerated motions inform the body of new and innovative ways to move if you're, you know, if you're in trouble. And so it does the same thing to your mind. Uh, having innovative approaches, more creative approaches to a, an idea in the boardroom or, uh, you know, in the classroom or even on the playground, it really keeps you on your toes. And it also builds trust, you know, just simply laughing with each other breaks down barriers and builds trust. And so watching how other animals engage in these rituals first is a reminder of how important those rituals are to them. Like lions need to learn how to hunt and need to learn how to coordinate with each other. But it also reminds us that this is, these rituals are not just important to learn how to hunt. They're important for us to learn how to be creative and innovate. Anthropologists, um, think that we learned how or we needed to have group rituals in order to hunt. So I'm talking about lions. So I thought I'd mentioned that humans, you know, in the early days, we needed to take down giant sloths and mammoths in order to survive, but we couldn't do that on our own. We needed to form groups. And in order to form groups to have this coordinated action of hunting in a very dangerous situation. We needed to have ritual in order to build trust amongst each other and then learn how to coordinate. And that's really how group rituals um, became so important for us. Yeah, I love this part about play. I'm going to jump right ahead of my notes here because this was a great chapter. And I was inspired because I most evenings play fight with my kids. they are two boys at 11 and eight. And uh -huh. when you spelled out why do you practice behaviors, I, I just thought of actually, it's like drilling yourself in the army or in sport in any way you're preparing. But I found it really fascinating that it helps social behavior, but also knowing when to stop or when not to take it too far. Me watching elephants all the time, I can see when one male is more of a bully and he does take it too far and the other males don't like him. And it's, it's kind of, it's easy to translate that onto the playground where people don't like to play with the bully because you can't trust them. And, and building trust in play is a very important uh, uh, thing to do. Yeah, and I loved what you said about play. There's a line I pulled here. You said play behaviors are by nature ritualized or exaggerated forms of routine behaviors that serve to perfect important adult skills such as hunting, competing for a mate, or avoiding a predator. However, the play environment offers a special zone of protection. It allows one to experiment with any number of variables, including the element of surprise without the potential consequences of the real world. One essential element of play is experimenting with risk. The goal isn't necessarily to win, but to practice and to improve essential skills. And I felt that encapsulates the need for experimentation in the workplace to create enough variables to find one that works. It's an evolutionary need. I talk about that a little bit um, in the play chapter where, um, again, anthropologists think that Homo erectus might have gone extinct at a time where um, they studied how they gathered their uh, hunting implements and that they didn't travel as far as the Neanderthals and other uh, early humans, hominids. And they thought maybe that they were not being innovative enough. And, and that really reminds you of the importance of innovation and how you deal with climate change or 
any kind of change in your environment or a corporate change, you know, in your, in your, in your personal life. Um, you know, we think of play as only for children, but really, uh, some corporations are realizing the importance of play and they're incorporating that into, um, you know, having, uh, special meetings where they uh, would in, would incorporate games or role playing where you have the chance in a safe environment to play out all of these different um, possible outcomes. And um, that really helps us stretch our minds and build trust because you're experimenting in this safe environment where you can kind of throw out an idea which you might not normally do because you feel uncomfortable, but in this kind of uh, fictitious environment, you role play in a way that, that gives everyone more confidence. And this is just an extension of the play ritual. I love that part about Homo erectus because I thought about the famous cartoon you see in innovation where there is a couple of cavemen pushing a barrow up a hill and the wheels are square and then another one comes along and offering them these things the wheels and they're like we're too busy and this is what happens in organizations but i thought actually it goes right back to this least effort strategy and this is exactly what happens in organizational disruption it's true it's true you know it once something works you don't want to fix it or think that there's anything to improve it but you constantly can improve and uh, and be more creative and, and rituals help challenge us to think outside the box and think, oh, wait, that thing that we take for granted, it could be so much better and we just didn't think about it. Yeah, and I loved here, you, you shared a story of four-year-old Henry and his overprotective mom, Coochie. I thought there was a real lesson in here because you said embracing silliness is part of play. Being silly is not something frivolous that children should outgrow being silly is actually a highly adaptive behavior because it provides the opportunity to think outside the box, to shake up routines and to overturn convention just to see what happens. If we as adults embrace play throughout our lives, we will continue to nurture innovation, develop skills and build relationships. I loved how you put that, but I'd love if you'd share the story of Coochie and Henry. Yeah, um, I was doing a, a book on... Uh captive animals and the um the zoo atlanta has a group of chimpanzees um and each mother that i had the opportunity to meet had a very different strategy for how to raise their uh their baby and this mother coochie would not let go of her four-year-old um male he he most baby uh, chimpanzees were allowed to explore beyond the perimeter of the mother's reach. Um, but uh, Henry was too old to be so, uh, you know, she was like a helicopter mom. She just wouldn't let him out of her reach. And all of these other uh, chimpanzee babies were allowed to explore and play with each other. And once she did let him go, he just was so elated and would run around the enclosure and uh, kind of be silly and, and swing his arms in a way that was just uh, very relaxed. And um, it, it just really struck me how mothers need to let their children explore beyond their perimeter of safety in order to understand how to to think creatively and build confidence. Um, there's another example that I thought was fascinating. Um, I didn't incorporate it into the book, but I, I've just written another uh, essay on, on play. But uh, another colleague of mine experimented with robot movements and showed that if he allowed the robot to explore um, what it's like to, to have more legs than it had, how does it compensate with only those two legs when, when challenged? And the robot that was allowed to play with, um, they're using artificial intelligence. When the robot was allowed to play, the robot solved many more problems in, in terms of staying upright than those that were not allowed to play. 
And it just shows you, even with AI, the importance of, of letting, our, letting our guard down and exploring physically and mentally our environment to, to help us innovate. Wow, that's a fascinating one. I hadn't heard that. I, I look forward to reading that article. But we're, we're not going to get through all the rituals, but I wanted to share greeting rituals. And I loved your title of this chapter. You call it Spit Snot and Other Social Grease. And you start <laughs> this section with the beautiful Sanskrit namaste greeting. The light within me bows to the same light within you. I love that. But you also start here with the story of Big Mama. Yes. Um there there are so many things that I've learned from elephants about our own rituals. And this particular one, uh, Big Mama is the matriarch of this very large family, and she's really a diplomat. I mean, there, there are very different female characters out there at my field site. Um, you know, there's very aggressive, charge first, ask questions later, but Big Mama is is a, a real diplomat, and her family just you know really has a strong strong bond with her. But there was one situation where they were coming into the water hole to drink, and somehow Big Mama got separated from the rest of the group. There was some confusion. There's an estrus female in the family, which caused a little chaos with some of the young bulls that were kind of waiting around at the water hole. And somehow Big Mama got separated from the whole family. And this one young bull started to chase her. And he was chasing her around the perimeter of the water hole. And they were separated for some minutes with the family. But the family was so upset. And they were all standing in a group waiting. And finally, Big Mama got away from this young bull and came running to the family and immediately they surrounded her and rumbled and had their ears touching her and had their trunk. All of them were giving her a trunk to mouth greeting. And so this trunk to mouth ritual, it not only was a greeting in this situation, it was more like a, um, a conciliatory and rebonding of the group that the, their leader was back with them and she had been in trouble and it was so intense, this whole ceremonial way to bring her back in, like they would never want to leave her side again kind of thing. It was uh, it was so powerful. Um, you know, I also, I, I start the first chapter on the lost art of ritual with another greeting of two female elephants where, um, again, they may have been separated for minutes to maybe an hour and the there's almost this intense hormonal element to the um, to the greeting that's a little surprising. Um, so they would stand. They came urgently to each other right in the middle of the road. So I had to pull off the road because they were blocking my <laughs> passage. And they wave their ears at each other, drop their trunks to the ground, and lay their trunks on the ground. And then started rumbling and rumbling. And finally, they put their trunk in the other one's mouth, which is a very, very um, dangerous thing to do, trusting thing to do, because they, that other elephant could bite your trunk. And your trunk, the tip of your trunk is very, very sensitive. Uh, so the act of the greeting ritual in many species is a very dangerous thing to do and very trusting um, you know, I talk about that in the the hyena, where um, you know, they, you're, very trusting, very <laughs> trusting. Both male and female hyenas have either a penis or a hemi penis, which is very sensitive, and they lick it, which could easily turn into a very <laughs> painful event if they didn't trust the other. Um, mouth licking in wolves, mouth licking in dogs. Uh, for the rhino. They, the black rhino is very territorial, very aggressive, and they would approach each other. And it's a, they're not happy about having to approach each other. They're kind of bellowing at each other as they get closer and closer. And then finally, it's like leaving the swords at the door. They clack their horns back and forth, and then they stand apart from each other and suddenly are able to relax because they know now that they can drink in peace because they left they disarmed each other 
And, you know, in the early days, it was thought that humans evolved a handshake in order to show the other one that they were not holding a weapon. So, it's again, it's that trust and risk that you're taking by reaching out and having this greeting ritual. Yeah, and for our dog, list, dog lovers, you're a dog lover yourself. Those of you listening will, uh, while bringing your dog for a walk right now, many people do, do that's their ritual of listening to the show. But you, they love this part because you tell us, having evolved from wolves, domesticated dogs have adapted their greeting rituals to suit their human companions. A dog is, is the perfect example of how uh, important greeting is. A dog will never dream of not greeting you at the door, um, you know, that bowing down and they really want to lick your face. I mean, that that is their uh, what the, the a ritual that evolved with them. And so when people don't want a dog to lick their face, they have to let them do something to express that, you know, licking your hands or. I let my dog lick my face because of that, you, know? <laughs> you know what it means. You can understand yes. it. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and and you know they'll learn certain elements of play from you. So my dog during the pandemic hasn't been able to be as social, and uh, my uh, my husband likes to kind of push him in a, a wrestling situation. He'll he'll push at his shoulders. And so my dog starts to do that to other dogs. He'll come up and kind of give them a shoulder check. And these other dogs are like, what kind of ritual is that? That's not a play ritual. But they'll kind of let him do it. And uh, it's it's really interesting how the pandemic has created new rituals, even in our our own homes, uh, between our ourselves and our dogs. I mean, my dog now has this ritual when we switch off every other day walking him. And when my husband walks him, he'll come home and he has a whole new way of, of having a greeting ritual with me. It's like an excuse for another ritual. I'm sitting at my desk working and he wants to have a big play ritual when he comes home, which is not normally what we would have done before. So it's, it's kind of interesting how we solve some of our isolation by adding new rituals in, you know, the pandemic has really, uh, highlighted the importance of us being together and you know we're wearing masks to uh, protect each other so we can't see each other smile so it's even more important for our eyes to smile at each other and uh, we can't shake hands and greet like we normally do but at least we can see each other on zoom and have family reunions and we just celebrated my parents 60th wedding anniversary uh, all the relatives on zoom together and before the pandemic, we we probably wouldn't have done that. It's just we've we've become more comfortable with the only option we have to see each other, and and although that's a, that's a positive thing, but it's also just a reminder of how important it is to be in person when we can be safely, hopefully in the near future. <laughs> yeah, and you you build on this because if if we're to build on the idea of connection, uh, firstly showing vulnerability to the other person through greeting, etc. Then the next thing is group coordination of some sort. And you share the amazing experience you have of a coordinated selfish hunt and the bait ball. And I, I love this as an analogy for a whole organization moving in harmony and creating power and strength in, in numbers, really, because that's what's really going on here. Yes, uh, strength in numbers is really the key. And and I use some examples uh, in the ocean because I wanted to show how rituals are ubiquitous in nature across environments and across species. And watching these sailfish engage in a hunt, I mean, that requires an enormous trust because one of the swordfish, they, they first they corral up uh, anchovies by taking their fins their dorsal fins and using them as a sail and they swim around a, a group of fish with that, with that uh, dorsal fin up so that it's like a net and they bring that net around the fish. And then one of the uh, swordfish will dart through the middle and, and really take its sword and, and just move it through the ball of fish and that damages the fish and it stuns them and sometimes they'll be 
<laughs> there'll be a whole bunch of scales falling down in the water <laughs> column, and then they'll be able to, more of them will be able to catch the fish. But it's so coordinated. It's just like, it's so impressive how they're able to do this. They even use a blue flash within their um, within their dorsal fin, so that flashing of blue light we think also helps to stun the fish, confuse them. And so it really struck me how coordinated this group of, of fish are in a hunt. And so I start, uh, and, you know, I wanted to show where it, it might seem obvious that lions need to coordinate to hunt and what um, play elements they might include to be better hunters together. But I wanted to include many different species, you know, whales building a, a bubble net in order to trap fish and, and how for us, as I mentioned, we started group rituals um, to be better hunters but it also facilitates really important um, bonding within groups. So these, um, you know, many rituals are these kind of repeated, exaggerated elements where you might imagine synchronized swimming or a marching band all wearing the same colors and playing the same music. Um, the same is true for uh, small groups, whether they're religious groups or community groups. They might have a certain slogan or wear certain colors. Um, and what that does is it helps us feel stronger within that group. It, it builds our confidence that we have this safety net of many people that we can identify with and trust. And, and that is really powerful, but it, it also can mean that when you look at each other, you trust each other, but that means that people outside that circle of of your group uh, are maybe not to be trusted. And that's the part where we need to remind ourselves that just because you build trust and you identify with the group doesn't mean there's anything wrong with other groups. And this is where the power of group ritual comes in and the responsibility to not... Uh, look badly of, on those that are outside your group. And there's, there's a number of studies that show that people inherently do that. And what, you know, we've seen in politics throughout history, and we've seen in the last year in this country, what those group rituals can do in a political sense to really galvanize and um, motivate a group to do certain things that they wouldn't necessarily do on their own but you get caught up in the in the storm of it and and it reminds you how powerful these rituals are and how dangerous they can be and how we need to wield them in a very responsible way yeah and you talked about the physiological effects that these group rituals can have on individuals as well and i thought of the sports teams doing their little dance beforehand hitting helmets off each other in american football or New Zealand rugby team doing the haka, this kind yeah. of ritualized dance actually yeah. changes the brain state. I thought about this. So I, I never thought of that actual benefit of it. It's not just theater. It actually has a change in brain state because dopamine's pumping, oxytocin's pumping, and you become more confident. Yes. And, and that's the same with a call to arms where, you know, you have a general running up and down the line of horses calling everyone to arms. It's, it does the same thing, very powerful galvanizing uh, uh, behavior. Um, and, and again, that, that can have downsides <laughs> as well. But you know, it's also sh really surprising that sports fans, when they are cheering for their own team, they actually physiologically experience the same thing as as if they were playing the sport and and there's been a number of studies on that as well to the point where um you know canadian hockey fans are, are renowned for being you know uh very loyal to their team and very excited and and there's a study with a canadian doctor showing that they they had to recommend that some people not get so excited about their team because they could have a heart attack <laughs> It, it, but they it's as if they were playing themselves that's how powerful uh the fans and the stands can 
be. And that's how sometimes sports fans can get out of hand because they are so riled up and feel as if they are actually playing the, the game. I was thinking of the courtship rituals, which we'll talk about next. And I was thinking in Ireland, we used to have like the Cayley, which was like this ball, you know, a very, a very poor version of a ball, ballroom dance. But then I grew up in where you had these discos and I never thought of them as, as rituals until I read this, what you said about flamingos and their courtship rituals, because they're fascinating and they're very similar to human group rituals like ballroom dancing, swing or salsa. I'd love if you'd share this. Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, I had the good fortune of studying flamingo courtship behavior <laughs> and uh, in these big salt ponds in the British Virgin Islands, you get these groups of flamingos just before the courtship season in March. It's, it, it's all timed with the rain. And um, just before courtship, flamingos do this very bizarre thing. They, in the hundreds and even thousands, they group up and do this head flagging marching where they all march in synchrony. I mean, it looks like the most ridiculous thing. You couldn't believe that. <laughs> that this you was... haven't seen me in a disco. You haven't... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. We do have our human equivalent. But it, and it, it all starts with one individual, and then they all start marching back and forth, march, march, and their heads are flagging, and they have a specific call that they – release. And what this does for the group, it stimulates their hormones, it primes their hormones to then start doing courtship behaviors. And their courtship rituals are very, very specific. They evolve from stretching uh, and, and nesting behaviors. And so there's a, a whole cascade of, of, of specific behaviors that they engage in. And once they start doing that, it's contagious and then the females start to do it and then they start to pair off. So it's very, also very similar to square dancing um, where you have this line of, of uh, males on the one side, females on the other, and then they partner up and do all these different moves. And, uh, and it's also very similar to flamenco dancing with this very elaborate, uh, you know, even with the feathers and, um, and we've taken a lot of our rituals from nature, and it's really fascinating to see how we incorporate them, some in parallel, but also some, um, there's uh, many cultures in New Guinea that would take the bird courtship rituals and the feathers and the, the whole look of the bird and incorporate that into a cultural dance, uh, which is a whole part of, of courtship, which is really fascinating how we how we are influenced by our environment and bring in these elements into courtship. And just a break in the show to tell you that this show is sponsored by McCullen O'Connell Dance Lessons Online. Sign up now, $99.99 a month. <laughs> this was all a ploy to get that, get our business off the ground, Caitlin. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. You need to learn how to dance if you want to be able to do other things together. But well, next and to it's very similar to play where you can innovate in an environment, a very creative environment. It's a wonderful release where you meet up with other people. And uh, in that exercise of dance, you you're just training your brain to to be more plastic. And. If you're a poor dancer and that doesn't work, you talk next about the ritual of giving and you share that the ancient ritual of male offering a female a nuptial gift is common throughout the animal kingdom. I found this fascinating. You said it includes insects, birds, squid, dolphins, monkeys, and even great apes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Gifting is a really interesting phenomenon. And, you know, it really is true that the that gifting is more about the giver than, than the receiver. Um, but in some situations, um, nuptial gifts are given because the female has to either lay eggs or uh, raise chicks in a, in a nest. Um, so a male will approach a female with a gift partly to supplement her eggs, 
but also to demonstrate that he is fit enough to, to garner a gift to give her. And so there's, there's many different symbolisms. Uh, one is maybe bringing some nesting materials to her. And, and some of those actual physical objects be, become incorporated into their display. So a, a, a booby, a blue-footed booby from the Galapagos, the male will present the female with his gorgeous kind of um, iridescent blue feet. And he will present her also with a gift of a stick, which what is completely ceremonial because their evolutionary um, ancestor had made nests, but the, the, the modern booby does not make a nest. They just lay their egg on the ground. So it's interesting to see how there's a remnant of their evolutionary ancestor in this presentation of a stick that she can't use but it's just a, a ritualized gift. And then she will also show her feet. And that's one example where both get, get engaged in the ritualized performance. But a lot of, um, in birds especially, a lot of the displays are to demonstrate the energetics of the male. So a lot of the elaborate foot movements of some of the birds of paradise and, and others where the female is watching the male and she's just staring at him at watching this performance. And you wonder what is going on inside her head. And what she's doing is to see which one of them is the most fit. But she's also in her mind, she's also uh, becoming more fertile. So it's, it's a benefit to her, her voyeurism as well has it has an advantage. So it's a, uh, Courtship um, and, and gifting are, are intertwined in a lot of ways. Uh, but in our own culture, well, courtship and gifting are, are intertwined. But another aspect of gifting is to give a gift of food where uh, even in our own situations, if you're in a remote area and you depend on your crop and your crop failed that year, your neighbor could supply you with some um, sustenance to get you through the season, or a female lioness uh, could share food with another lioness that, that is not related in order to build her pride to protect against a marauding male from another pride that could come and kill all of their cubs to start a new pride. So there are many reasons why one might gift in nature, and and part of it is to build community, build trust, and also to um, to entice a mate. I found that a real great lesson for corporate innovation. So I'm in an organization. I need to build alliances. I need to find gifts of some sort I can give others to build trust with them, to maybe help with their influence or help with their projects, because. A lot of our audience are these change makers who often defy and break the rules. And I thought there about that, the booby giving the stick is, is a defunct ritual. It doesn't serve any purpose. And to many change makers or those who seek progress, that would be seen as a waste of time. You go, why would you bother going through that? But I thought that that is actually the point. And one of the reasons I wanted you on the show is to understand that deeply ingrained in all of us is this attraction towards rituals. So sometimes we need to perform those rituals, even if we think they're silly. Yes, no, that is an excellent point. The, the, it's, it's the act of engaging in the ritual that is the importance of, of, of why you do it. Um, you know, engaging in ritual stimulates the brain. It, it, it um, stimulates the amygdala to help us concentrate, to help us focus to help us be more creative. It's, it's the act of the ritual itself, not necessarily the end result, but in doing it uh, causes us to bond together. Uh, and, you know, playing a silly game with that uh, competitor or, or a teammate, it sticks in your mind, the things that may have come out of that game, and it, it bonds you. You laugh about it in the future, and then that 
helps you feel more comfortable raising a certain idea to to start a iterative process on on innovating something new. You gave me such great language in in this book, Caitlin, to understand to to put a mental model on how we're animals as well, and and sometimes we don't consider ourselves animalist animals, but we have animalistic behavior because even reading that and listening to you now it reinforces, for example. I, I run corporate workshops, etc. And and this is the exact principle that I'm trying to harness is that when we're in play, our brain state is different, and we're more receptive to information. And it's more likely to stink stick versus when you're in a very serious corporate environment, and the dictate is let's innovate around here, and nobody can operate that way. And I found that really fascinating. Yeah, you know, you reminded me that uh, children when they are playing with each other, they have demonstrated much more flexibility in their language than when adults are present. And, and what you just said, it allows a group to form this little bubble of trust where things will come up that wouldn't come up if your supervisor is present or some kind of a dominance hierarchy within the corporation. But if you're within that group, you're going to feel more comfortable and studies have shown this in different ways. And, and it's really fascinating to think that children innovate with language more so when they're with their peers than uh, when they're with an adult. That's children with language. But another important chapter you dedicate to this is nonverbal rituals, because oftentimes we lose touch with those. We are too busy to recognize them or take the time to recognize the nonverbals. And I love the story you tell of Smokey, who essentially displayed great leadership and was a positive role model for others in the future. There's two lessons I draw, derived from this was he didn't have to do anything to prove himself. But then in doing that, others were watching him and learning that behavior and carried it on throughout the generations. Yes, um, there's two characters that I focus on. Smokey is one of them and Greg is another one. Um, it, yeah, I mean, male elephants ha have a lot to teach us <laughs> um, about how to manage leadership and how to uh, really approach leadership from a, um, a kind of carrot and stick perspective where, um, let's give a good example of this. Um, Body language is really important in elephants. So, and, and, you know, we've heard these things about, you know, sitting with your shoulders back and having more confidence and, you know, fake it till you make it. Just being confident, just, just making the decision to be confident helps make you confident. And then everyone else sees you as more confident. Uh, elephants in their body language really always exhibit this where, um, a confident bull like Smokey, he would march into the uh, the field site. He, there's a big clearing and he comes out of the forest and it just looks like this giant boulder moving through the environment. And as he enters, it's just this magnificent, larger than life uh, creature with his shoulders up and his head up and he kind of prances in. And he is a must bull and it, it, during our field season. So elephants, when they're in the state of must, it's like rut and antelope where they, um, they're hormonally in, in a reproductive state and looking for females. Um, but elephants do it differently than antelope where they have turn taking. And when one male is in must, the others are not except for, you know, there might be two or three in the region, but all the other bulls are not in must. And they're supposed to be overly hyper aggressive and don't tolerate any other bulls around. But Smokey's not like that. He's really outgoing and um, he's a very social must bull, which is not supposed to happen. But he'll let younger bulls come up and inspect him in must. They'll approach and they'll smell him and, and he just lets them be around him and most must bulls would kind of toss to slap younger males away which he just doesn't do that he has confidence he lets them experience his 
amazing nature <laughs> and 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 the state of being in must which must, um, many young bulls are curious about because they don't understand it they're learning what must is and they they have never experienced it yet because they're too young um but he lets them do that and and most must bulls don't so that's really fascinating um the other leader in the group is is Greg and he would let young bulls um, really hang on him where most older bulls can't tolerate younger bulls interacting with them. So they're, they're very tactile. So young bulls grow up in a family and they're used to tactile interaction. They're used to being around other elephants. And so when they leave their family, it's kind of like a bar mitzvah. <laughs> they're 12 to 15 years old and there's kind of a give and take with the family. The mothers are like, okay, it's time to leave. And they want to leave, but they don't. But so then when, when they're out in their in the environment by themselves, they have to find older bulls that are willing to mentor them because they don't want to be by themselves. And they so they look to these older bulls. And Greg is one of these older bulls that brings the younger ones in. And you think, well, why would he do that? That means he has to share food in the environment with these young bulls that have uh, an accelerated growth phase. They've got to eat a lot. You've got a lot of mouths to feed. So why would you do that? Why would you bring them along with you? And it becomes very obvious that when Greg is at the waterhole with his little posse of younger bulls that he's brought together with him, he can then intimidate other bulls that he doesn't like and doesn't want to come to the waterhole he gets his whole group to intimidate that one bull and they all stand in a line with their ears out. And it's like the walk of shame. This one bull comes and he's trying to get to the water hole and these bulls do not want him to access it. And so you can see from Greg's behavior, how he builds a coalition of trusted individuals so that they can be a strong team to defend their resource and push off an adversary. So it's really uh, just a fascinating example of, um, you know, managing a group and getting what you need, the power of that group and how it's exerted. And, you know, he's not that aggressive. He's not that mean, shall we say, um, but he knows how to wield a group to his advantage, which is fascinating. Yeah, I love that. There's so much in that from building an army of the willing. So those people around them and in change initiatives or even being the CEO of an organization. But also I found the mentorship, that idea of passing on knowledge, whether it be organizational knowledge or survival knowledge in this case with the elephants. I found it really fascinating. We're running out of time. So I really wanted to talk about burial rituals. These are fascinating. And I found it remarkable that so many social animals from elephants to chimpanzees to zebras display funerary rituals in which they seem to mourn for the dead and express grief in ways that are strikingly similar to us. And you share many stories of death and burial rituals. But one I thought was fascinating was that of Vernon Presley of the Fresno Chaffee Zoo and the necessity to put down a matriarch. I found this a compelling one. Yes. Um, yeah, Vernon shared that story with me. I really wanted to include an elephant grief, grieving ritual. In my experience, I've only seen elephants that have already passed and family members that would walk past um, that elephant on the way to the water hole and they would visit with that elephant. But I wanted to see, I wanted to hear a story of what happens exactly during that process and after. And um, Vernon's had many experiences with, with elephants passing in captivity, but this one in particular, he was very concerned because there were two younger individuals that were so bonded with her that they were worried that if she just disappeared and they didn't get to uh, get the experience of, of visiting with her as she passed, he thought that they would really be psychologically damaged. And so they... Um, arranged for it that the the matriarch would be put down in the enclosure so that all the elephants could visit with her. And 
ones that were not bonded with her would they came up sort of acknowledged that she was there and lying down but then they went off but the two that were really closely bonded with her they stayed with her throughout the night rumbling and they even took dirt and were putting it in their trunks and covering her body with dirt so by morning she had a whole layer a couple inches of of dirt all over her and uh Vernon had never experienced this this burial uh ritual in elephants and after talking about it we think that it's possible that these two younger uh individuals had come from Mozambique and uh they would have had that cultural knowledge of a burial ritual with their own families of elephants and they then used that ritual in captivity where no one had ever seen it before and so that that would be then a way of culturally passing on that knowledge and it's just another reminder of how important cultural knowledge is with elders in a corporation elder elephants in a in an elephant uh family group that have to survive um as many instances of older females showing uh fa- younger families how to find water in a drought situation where if there was only young families they wouldn't have experienced the previous drought say 20 years earlier and they wouldn't know where to go so elders in in the population are really important assets and this uh this burial ritual was just a, a reminder of the importance of elders and the importance of learning rituals that allow one to grieve this this allowed them to focus on her and give them something to do and think about while they were covering her body with with dirt it was really powerful i found that so powerful and also the lesson in diversity there where they were from different regions and the knowledge got passed on from a different region and that's the whole idea of bringing people from different backgrounds together to come up with the best survival methodology so i think that's the thing we often think about best creative options but really creativity leads to survival and we've shown that you've shown that through homo erectus and not evolving not innovating but i i loved i thought a great way to finish was the whole idea of everything being connected because i found this fascinating you mentioned about the flamingos and their dance behavior being triggered perhaps by weather or rain and i was in awe of how everything is so interconnected you mentioned the rains trigger termites the termites provide food for birds who happen to be passing overhead at that exact time migrating and i loved this whole idea of the the necessity for those things but also it shines a light on how climate change affects all those things because it changes weather patterns i'd love if you'd share some thoughts on this yes um you know there've been some striking uh headlines in the past year and i'm thinking more about climate change and figuring out the best ways of documenting it and helping others think about how what changes we can implement and you know there's one headline of birds dropping out of the sky um because their migratory path was uh on fire and the the area that they were used to going in order to get enough food to continue their migration they didn't have anything to eat because the whole area was on fire and so by the time they got to the next place they were start they were flying they were basically skeletons in the sky just dropping out of the sky because they were starving and this is just uh it's is so hard to think about um but you know the increase in fire and even a couple of degrees uh increase changes so many things around the world and and so many cascades of of uh change and you know I talk about um the importance of migration but also the importance of our own travel and you know you mentioned getting people from different regions if we are able to learn from each other and see how other people live and how other animals live in different environments it really stimulates us to to think outside the box I and mean, there's a number of good studies on this showing that people that travel or people that spend time abroad during their college actually are able to think more broadly than if they hadn't and um the the last chapter i wanted to end with this idea that 
we are so connected to nature and we need to remind ourselves by placing ourselves in a natural environment to allow ourselves to experience nature in a way that, you know, our technologically driven lives tend to just really push those things aside and don't think that they're important. But they're actually important for your work. They make you more productive by looking at these other animals in their environment. Uh, you know, I also talk about renewal rituals and seeing how other animals, you know, they also go through spring cleaning and clean out their nests uh, for a very specific purpose, just like we have in the past, you know, tried to keep uh, parasites out of our houses and, uh, you know, rodents are doing that, birds are doing that for the same purpose. And it, it just reminds us that all animals uh, have similar rituals for for the same reason. And it, it just it really helps us think about interconnectivity and how we can learn from others, other humans, but also other social animals. Beautiful. I think that's a wonderful way to finish. I, I had a quote picked out that I wanted to share, but I think you've done a far better job by sharing what you just shared. Caitlin, for people who want to find out more about your work, where can they find you? Um, my author website is www.caitlinoconnell, all one word, dot com. My nonprofit uh, where we do all this elephant research is utopiascientific.org. Um, Elephant Skinny is my social media handle. <laughs> Author of Wild Rituals, 10 Lessons Animals Can Teach Us About Connection, Community and Ourselves, Caitlin O'Connell, the light within me bows to the same light within you. Thank you very much. Namaste. <laughs> Thank you. Beautiful.